going to be a talk about coroutines. Um, if you've done anything with coroutines before, you know that things do tend to get a bit messed up. Uh, so let's just um, correct that. There we go. That's a bit better. So C++ coroutines from scratch. Now, uh, some of you may have seen this talk before because I, I gave it just last month in, uh, in Berlin at meeting C++ and a couple of times before. Actually, each time I've given it, it's been almost completely different material. It's actually really difficult to get this one right. So hopefully I finally nailed it. Uh, before we get into that, um, Klaus just introduced me, but I'll just uh, follow up by saying, yes, I'm developer advocate at Sonar, is the t-shirt. I've got some cleaning cloths down here as well, if you want to uh, clean as you code. And if you're, if you're low on uh, East Const wristbands, I've got some others as well. Don't miss those. Uh, yeah, we, we do uh, static analysis tools. Um, I'm not going to talk about that tonight. Actually, it's going to get one mention towards the end, just to uh, give you a heads up. Um, but you could talk to me about that afterwards. Uh, Phil underscore Nash on Twitter, while well, that's still running. Otherwise, at Mastodon, at philnash.me, I'm now set up there as well. All right. So, coroutines. This is a, a slightly different approach to talking about coroutines. Uh, actually, who here has already... Um, who, who's already an expert at C++ coroutines? <laughs> okay, um, try an easy one. Who, who's already comfortable with C++ coroutines? Maybe you've already used them on a project or you, you think that you probably could. A couple of hands from people that have done talks on them. <laughs> All right, who's seen at least one other talk on coroutines for C++ and still doesn't quite get it yet? Right, a lot more hands. Yeah, that, that's, that's normal. Uh, and it seems to be the rite of passage. You, you have to watch a few talks, read a few articles, and at some point you think, ah, yeah, all those things I was hearing about there, they start to come together. So it, it does take a bit. So I'm taking a little bit of a liberty with this one. Um, it's not going to be uh, everyone's first attempt at co-routines and they're going to get it. Um, maybe that would be you. Let me know if that's the case. But one of the problems that I see teaching any complex subject, it seems to be particularly the case with coroutines, is that you boil the examples down to the simplest possible thing. So you're not distracted by the problem, you can just learn the, the coroutines themselves. And the trouble with that is twofold. One is you go away um, thinking, yeah, but how does that scale to real world problems? I want to see that. And the other problem is, Coroutines being somewhat complex, especially C++ coroutines, you go away thinking that was a really complex solution to a very simple problem, so, which is not that motivating in terms of how you're going to use it. So the risk I'm taking here is I'm going to try and present a slightly more real world, more complex problem to start with, which sounds great when I say it like that, but obviously the, the big risk is maybe by the time we actually get to using coroutines, I've already lost you. So that, that, that's a risk, and some people have told me that's happened. That's why I've been iterating this material. But if it works, hopefully you'll, you'll come out of here thinking, yeah, that, that was a, a good matching complexity for the problem at hand. I can see why that would be useful. That's really the aim here. And if not, if it doesn't work for you, don't worry, there'll be another talk on coroutines coming along soon. <laughs> so let's, um, let's get stuck in. So what's the problem I'm going to be talking about? So I'm actually going to show you three code demos. We're going to iterate this, this problem a bit. And I'm going to warn you, it's going to be the second half before we actually get onto coroutines at all. Um, and it's based on a, a really real problem that I had um, years ago when I was a real developer, uh, about uh, seven or eight years ago now, uh, working in finance on a quant library. Uh, who's worked on a quant library before? Anyone? There's usually a few in the room. Don't worry. Uh, you don't need to know anything about that background. It's just purely to give us a bit of context, uh, more sort of a real world problem. So um, in the quantum library, you've got loads of types like this. This is just a subset for them. Um, we're just going to look at these ones today. And so you don't need to worry about what any of these mean. It doesn't matter. Um, so I'm going to, we, we've got code for all of these in this code base. We're not going to look at that in detail, but I'm just going to give you a highlight now just so you've got a sense for it. So I've bowled out all of the implementation, got it down to the simplest possible thing. You've got things like this one, it's quite simple. It's just a load of value types, um, and some vectors and things, but they're all just value types. So nice and straightforward. Notice it derives from this F object, something I made up, but it's the singularly rooted 
uh, polymorphic hierarchy. Not particularly fashionable these days, but still quite common in quant libraries, but uh, something to bear in mind. Um, slightly more complex example, this one's forward, so it also derives from F object. But this has, um, well down here you can see these shared pointers to these curves. So these are dependencies. And what actually happens is you build up this object graph with these shared dependencies. Um, and even more important, that, that curve there also derived from F object, of course, but it itself is the base of a little polymorphic sub hierarchy of curves. So we don't actually know which curve it is in there. So you've got polymorphic dependencies. Okay, so far, so good. Uh, we've also got some implementation inheritance, even less fashionable. But uh, I've managed to get rid of the references to that in the, the demo. So I've just kept it in here uh, for the sake of, sake of it. All right, what, what about all these objects? So far, it doesn't look anything that interesting. Well, what you want to do a lot in quantum libraries and other projects is serialize and deserialize these things. There's plenty of talks about the actual serialize and deserializing part, but that's the context of the problem. So we've got, um, in this case, some JSON representing these objects. Uh, could be coming from anywhere, database, file system, um, some sort of message queue, whatever, doesn't matter. Comes in, in this case is JSON, and we need to be able to uh, build these objects from, from that data, okay? Now notice we've got those dependencies in there. So the actual values there tell you what objects then to load for the dependencies. Fair enough. Although those polymorphic ones there, they're gonna give you uh, a bit of JSON that just tells you what actual object to load. So there's an extra level of indirection in there as well. Um, yeah, then you'll, you get something like this for the fitted bond discount curve. All right, we'll get there, I promise. This is what we're gonna try and do. We wanna load and build these two objects. They're both fixed rate bond forwards. And in doing so, we're gonna to need to build up this whole object graph. This is 10 objects here in order to get the two we actually wanted. Okay, now we can get to some code. So, switch the, yep, okay. So this first example is gonna be our like first run at the problem, um, no coroutines at all, and we're gonna do it the simplest possible way we can think of. In each of these examples, main is gonna be exactly the same. So I'll just talk you through that once, pretty straightforward. So we've got, well, the main parts, this load and build objects here. I meant to stand over here, let's try and do that. That's gonna do the work, we'll get into that. You can see we're passing it the fixed rate bond forwards. Now these are what I call IDs. So you've got the slash and then a number, just some sort of unique ID. And we'll get these objects back. Now you can see I'm using uh, std chrono to get start and end time, get the duration, and then print it out in milliseconds. So we're just timing how long that takes to load those 10 objects. You might think, well, is milliseconds gonna be accurate enough? And it turns out it is, for reasons we'll come on to in a moment. And then at the end, we're just doing a sort of a smoke test really to see whether we actually loaded what we thought we were gonna load. So we know that the, the second object here is a fixed rate bond forward. Um, so we'll cast that down. And then we'll get one of those dependencies out, this discount curve, which we happen to know by looking at the data is a fitted bond discount curve, we'll cast that. And finally, from that, we can pull out one piece of data and just uh, test that that's the case. So, pretty straightforward. Hope, hope you're all with me so far. That's, um, that's what we're trying to do. How are we gonna do it? So, you can see we've got this repo object. Let's start there. We have a look in there, very simple again. We've got this uh, unordered map of IDs to F object pointer, which I'll hover over, you can see, is just a, um, an alias for a shared pointer of F object. We use it a lot, so worth having that. Uh, and that's our cache. So as we load things in, they're gonna go in the cache. If we need them again, they'll already be loaded. This load helper we'll look at in a moment, and then our load and build objects. Okay, um, can anyone, everyone see the code okay, by the way? I think I've got the font size up enough. You think it should go higher, Klaus? Was that a yes or an okay? Yes. yes. Let's uh, try to remember the 
Ah, I worked it out earlier. There we go. How's that? Great. All right, so load and build objects, where the magic happens. So you can see we're passing the IDs in as an initializer list, we're returning a vector of the, the built objects. We know how many there are, so we can reserve them up front. We iterate the IDs coming in. We lock them up in the cache because we may have already loaded them. And if it's in the cache, then we can just push that straight onto our vector. Otherwise, we call load, which we'll look at in a moment. That will return the object, and then we push it onto our vector. And we can return it. So pretty straightforward, again. And here's load up here. All that's doing is so pushing the, the main work onto deserialize this time. Um, but then it will add the object to the cache once it's loaded. So maybe load and cache would have been a better name. All right. All with me so far. Let's have a look then at deserialize. And this starts to look a little bit more interesting. So we've got this uh, load as JSON. That's actually loading it from the file system in this case. As I say, it could be from database or something. Uh, wrapping it in this deserializer, just add some extra interesting methods. Um, we're going to get one of the fields out of the JSON type tells us what type of object we want. And then we do effectively a type switch here. I'm just doing a ca series of cascading ifs. Um, that's not really going to scale very well. You're probably going to want to have some sort of factory with a map, but you can imagine what that looks like. But this will do us for this example. So what we're doing is just testing it against the different types and then forwarding on to this template function build the appropriate type. We'll look at that next. But before we get there, just note that these polymorphic types like curve treat you slightly differently here because it has this field instance, remember from the JSON earlier, that tells us what to actually load. So we're just going to recursively call back on ourselves to, to load the actual object. All right, let's have a look at the build for fitted bond discount curve. I picked this one because it's the simplest one that has an implementation. So we, we create one of these objects and we just use our deserializer to write the values into the fields. Simple as that, really. Um, lots of error handling that I haven't really shown here, of course, but you get the idea. That's, that's not the important part. All right, simple enough. If we look at fixed bond forward uh, builder, a little bit more complex here. So we've got one field we're just serializing in as before, but now we have our, in this case, three dependencies. So what we're going to do is recursively call back onto the repos load and build objects. So the way back up to the top again, to load these three objects now. And we, we pull out the names of the deserializer. That's going to get them back here as depths. And then for each one, we'll cast it down and write it into our fields. So still, I think, relatively straightforward. Even though there's a bit more going on here. So hopefully you follow all of that. So there's two problems here. Uh, one of which may be noticed as I was going through. We're actually passing the repo all the way down from the top so that we can make that recursive call all the way back up again. So we've got really tight coupling. The repo knows about the deserializers. The deserializers know about the repo. So not a great design even though it does actually make things easier for us here. That's usually how these bad designs come about. We do the easiest thing, but then we have problems down the road. So that's not great. Perhaps more importantly, again, considering this is um, something for finance, performance is usually an issue. If I run that, you say it completed in 126 milliseconds. I'll run it a couple more times, it's about the same each time. And that's a debug build. If I do a release build instead, you see it's about the same. It doesn't really make a difference. You know, the reason is, a bit that I didn't show you, in that load as JSON, I've added this sleep <laughs> for 10 milliseconds. Uh, as it says, to simulate data store access latency. So here I'm loading from the file system, which on my M1 Pro MacBook Pro SSDs is pretty fast. But normally, we'd be calling over a network to, to a database or something. And it's that round trip cost that I'm 
I'm really simulating here. And, you know, maybe you can put it down a bit, but still, the, the, the performance cost of this is going to be dominated by that round trip cost. And we're doing one round trip for each object, so 10 objects. That's 10 millise uh, 100 milliseconds just for that alone. So that's most of, most of what we're doing. But if we go back to the slides briefly, here. Yeah. Remember, this is what we're trying to load, this whole object graph. We know straight away that we want these two fixed rate bond forwards. So we could ask, let's say, the database for those two in one round trip. And when we got that, if we just fight, ask each one what its dependencies are up front before trying to load them, we can get the next five dependencies in another batch and then the last two in the last batch. So we'll actually end up with something more like this. So just three batches, three round trips to the database. And you would expect, you would hope that that would perform a bit better. So let's have a look at how we might do that. Um, yeah, so this is our second code example now. Now I said main is the same, so that hasn't changed. Let's have a look in repo. We've got the cache as before, that's not changed either. But now we've got this extra vector of strings or IDs called to load. And this is really the, where the batching comes in. We're going to batch up the IDs in this vector uh, and then load them each time. And then we've got a couple of other helpers. We'll look at that in a minute. It's going to load and build objects. So as before, we've got our IDs coming in here. But now the first thing we do is we've got to add all of those IDs to our to load vector, but we may have already loaded them. They may already be in the cache. So we're going to call this require object each time is one of those helpers. So it's going to look up in the cache first and, and return it if it's there, but otherwise it adds it to, to load. So that should end up the first time it's going to add all of the IDs. Subsequently, it may only add some of them if they're already cached. So that's what that line's doing. And we've still got quite a bit more code here now. We've got this vector here of build tasks, incomplete tasks. What's this all about? So if we are going to be starting to, well, loading objects, starting to build them, but not completing them because they're awaiting dependencies, we're going to have these partially built objects hanging around. And we also need to track what the dependencies are and how to wire them up. And that's what these build tasks are for. So that, that's what we're going to return. And then we're going to this while loop where we say while there are objects to load, call deserialize all on them. So in the previous example, we had a deserialize function for each individual object. Now we've got a batch deserializer. And that, that's the thing that actually returns these build tasks. So instead of the objects, we get these perhaps partially built objects back. We'll look into there in a moment. We can clear the um, to load vector for now. Now we're going to go through those build tasks we got back and try to resolve those dependencies because some of the objects are leaf objects. They have no dependencies, so we can get the object out. Some of them may have dependencies that are already cached, so they can be built straight away. Um, and if so, they will go straight into the cache. Otherwise, we'll put that task in our incomplete tasks vector. So that vector that we started up here is just going to track the ones that we haven't been able to build, build yet. Now, in resolve dependencies, if we have a look in there, you see, ask the task for its dependencies. If they're not already met, we'll call that require object. We looked at that earlier. It looks it up in the cache, otherwise add it to, to load. Which means when we come out to resolve dependencies, if there are any unresolved dependencies, we're going to have more IDs to load in the to load vector. If it is met, then we can now supply that dependency. Internally, that's going to wire it up because it's holding a reference to the, to the member. We won't look at the details there. And if any of them are unmet, then when we come down here, sorry, if none of them are unmet, the other way around, sorry, then that task has a resume method. And that's going to call us back on a lambda. We'll see that in a minute. 
to actually carry on building. Finally, we get an object and we can put that in the cache. So after resolve dependencies, we'll have either put more things into to load or we'll have put the object into the cache. Now, now, now it's starting to get a little bit more involved. So I'll try not to rush too much, but once we've done that, and say we may actually have stuff back into load. So we'll go around the while loop till eventually we'll have loaded everything that we need to. But we'll have these incomplete tasks still in, the, in this vector. So we're going to iterate that backwards using std ranges views reverse because we'll go from the uh, least dependent back up to the most dependent and then start calling resolve dependencies on each of those. And now this time they should all resolve because we should have everything. Hopefully that makes sense. So by this point, we'll have loaded everything into the cache. The last bit is just transforming that into our output vector by looking up in the cache. So we've got our objects. Hopefully that still made sense. I know it's getting a little bit more intricate now. And this may not be the way you design it either. That's, that's fine. Lots of different ways to do this. This is not quite how we did it before, but it was like the simplest version of that I could get into a, a demo project. Right. What we haven't looked at here is deserialize all. So let's go into that now. So we've now got a vector of IDs coming in and we're returning a vector of build tasks. I've moved that sleep into here, so we only pay the cost once per batch. This time we know how many build tasks up front, so we reserve them. We've got a deserializer for each object as before. And then we call this build object for each one. If we look in there, this may look a little bit familiar. Uh, got a question from Timo. So the, the question was, why are we deferring loading the dependencies rather than loading immediately as we did before? Because when we were doing that before, that's what led us to have the individual round trips for each object. So we had to make 10 round trips to the database, whereas now we can batch them. So we only pay the round trip cost once per batch. So three round trips instead of 10 in this case. That, that's, that's the purpose of all this complexity. Does that make sense? But here we are looking at an individual object, so we call build object. And this looks very similar to the deserialized method in the, in the original example. One big difference is we're not now threading the, the repo in. So that, that's gone. So we've lost that uh, circular dependency. That's good. The type switch looks very similar though. One other difference is we're not treating the curves differently. We have a separate curve builder here. But let's have a look again at build for fitted bond discount curve. Remember, that's the simplest one. It's a, it's a leaf object. So this looks almost exactly the same, except that it's returning a build task instead of the object. But you can see it is actually returning the object, but wrapping it in a build task. And then when resolve dependencies is called, it would immediately get that out. That's the only difference. But if we look up to the fixed rate bond forward builder. See, this gets a little bit more complex. We've got a straightforward uh, value being deserialized there. But the dependencies now, we've got a separate dependencies object that we declare here. And we call dot require on that for each of our dependencies. We pass in the, the member we want to write it into. And it's actually going to catch a reference, capture a reference to that. Actually, wrap it in a lambda. I won't show you the, the code, but so that later when it gets the value, it can write it in on our behalf. And the name of the field that we get the dependencies value from, uh, name from rather. So do that with each of our dependencies here. That's just saying what they are. And then we're going to come out of here. We want to get called back later when those dependencies are in. So 
That's where this build task comes in. Create one here and call continue with dependencies on it. But remember, this is not co-routines yet. This is just C++ 17, if you squint, code. Pass it in the dependencies that we just created. And then this Lambda. This is our, our callback. So continue with this Lambda when the dependencies are in. Note that we've had to move in our object. This is the thing that we're building because by the time we get called back, this stack frame is going to be long gone, as well as dependencies, of course. But if we had any other state here, we'd have to move that in as well. But then other than that, you can consider this bit of code, a continu literally a continuation of the same function that we started out in. That's conceptually what we're trying to do here. But this is what we've, we've done for, for years. So we immediately return the task, and then later we'll get called back. Hopefully that's straightforward again. Well, a little bit more again, but hopefully you can follow it. Should also look at curve, because this is similar, but also different, because these um, intermediate curve objects, they, they don't actually make it into the object graph. Remember, they're just placeholders while we're actually waiting for the real curve. So that leads to this abomination, a make shared of shared pointer. Why do we have that? Well, we actually want to load a curve. So this is the object that we're, we're building. But we need to move something into our Lambda so that when it gets called back, it will have been filled out for us, which means we need something with a stable address in memory. And if that's on the stack, obviously that's going to go away. So we have the shared pointer to a shared pointer so that we can write into the, into the first one. If that doesn't make sense, don't worry, it's not that important. But it does sort of lead to these sort of weird designs. But then we can create our dependencies object again, say dot require. And here we'll say we're, we want to write into what that top level shared pointer is pointing to. Build task, continue with dependencies again, move the dependencies in, but this time move the curve holder. That's the, the object that's holding our actual curve. And, and that's it. Then now what the curve holder is pointing to is our actual object at the end. So slightly different, but same, same principle. Now, what does all this extra complexity give us? Let's, uh, let's run that and see. Was it worth it? Well, we've got it down to 39 milliseconds. If I run again. Ooh. Okay. I'm not sure what happened there. I'm going to run that a few more times to be sure. I think I did something in between. But yeah, usually it comes out at around uh, 36 milliseconds. So it's about the sort of uh, speed up that we, we expected. Now, I've just seen the, the sign to say that um, we're halfway through and I'm just about to come into co-routines. How about that for timing? But before we do that, the one other thing I didn't show you, I'm not going to go into depth here because it's a little bit more involved, but this build task, if I get rid of that, we've got the, the object we actually wanted, wanted to build, maybe partially built. We've got the dependencies that we're tracking, this vector, the ID, and in this continuation, so that's the thing that's holding the, the lambda we, we passed in, the thing we actually want to continue with. Now, because we're moving these build tasks around, it's convenient, not necessary, to hold that data in a separate struct that we then hold by unique pointer. So all of the moving stuff around is done for us effectively. At least that's what I'm going to claim for now. And then the rest of it is really just sort of an interface into all of those bits and pieces. So I won't go into more detail there. Uh, and really that's all there is to it. There's a bit more independences, but we'll, we'll save that for another day. So let's go back to the slides. So without resorting to coroutines yet, we have solved our batching problem. But well, I think you'll agree it's introduced a lot of extra complexity into the code. But we got a big benefit, so it was worth it. 
So the obvious question is, how do we do the same thing with coroutines? Let's talk about coroutines, since we're halfway through the talk. Seems like a good time. So here's a, uh, an overview of the moving parts involved in coroutines. This is where you would traditionally get overwhelmed. So I'm going to try to introduce them gradually. Hopefully that will um, ease the shock. So over here on the left-hand side are all the things that we need to provide. There's uh, three types usually, sometimes two. And on the right-hand side is what's provided by the compiler or the standard library. Now you can see the coroutine frame spans both sides. Um, although that's all managed by the compiler standard library side, because it holds the promise type that we provide, and we'll talk about that in a minute, we're, we're spilling out onto, onto this side. We never have direct access to the coroutine frame, though. We'll talk about that in a minute. Let's start, actually, with the, the task or generator type. Um, think of generator as a specialized task. It's not quite, but that will do us for today. We've been mostly talking about tasks anyway. So this is obviously um, the equivalent of our build task in the previous example. It plays a very similar role. And in a moment, we'll have a look at it and you'll see how similar it is. This is our interface to the coroutine. So we provide our own interface. I can think of it like a remote control. And it's achieving that because it has a, usually, has a reference to this coroutine handle. Like I say, we don't touch the coroutine frame directly, but with the coroutine handle, we can do things like obviously resuming a coroutine, uh, destroying it, a um, couple of other things, copying it, not copying it, we can move it. Talk about ownership in a minute. But we can also get to the promise type. Because although we write the promise type, we don't create it. It's actually sitting there in the coroutine frame. So the coroutine frame is created usually in a heap, one heap allocation by the coroutines infrastructure. We don't do that. And that will contain all of the um, automatic storage variables from the coroutine, a few other bits of bookkeeping, and the promise type. They all live in the coroutine frame, which means they're all there for the entire duration of the coroutine. That's a really important point. But we don't have direct access to it. But from the coroutine handle, we can, all, we can ask it for a pointer to the promise type, or the instance of the promise type. So we can put state in there, and then via the coroutine handle, we can get access to that state. So that, that's why it's nice to have this type that acts as an interface for the rest of the code, so it doesn't have to worry about coroutine handles and promise types. Okay, what else have we got? So, lifetimes. Stood coroutine handle was not an RAII type, which means it, does, it has a dot destroy method. We have to take care of calling that at the right time from our task. Usually, your task type is uh, at most a move only type. Doesn't make sense to, to copy it. Um, very often, not even movable. So you just destroy it in your destructor and you're done. If you want to move it, then you have to do a little bit more work, but not much. But it's your responsibility to clean it up. There are some cases where you don't clean it up from the task. In fact, the coroutine itself sort of cleans itself up. We're not going to discuss those today. Uh, and as I mentioned, you can get to the promise type there as well. Um, what am I missing? Ah, yes. The other thing that has a reference to the coroutine handle, or gets given one, is this awaiter. I haven't talked about awaiters yet. Um, an awaiter is anything that you can call co-await on. Or rather, if you use the co-await keyboard, you call it on an awaiter object. There's an asterisk there. I'll talk about that in a minute. It has an interface that tells the compiler what happens at different points when you call await, 
when it suspends, when it resumes. And in fact, the, the library provides two specialized awaiters. They're very simple, called suspend always and suspend never. They have almost no implementation other than just to say what happens when you suspend. And the names tell you what they do. And because they're known at compile time, you'll often use those as return types from some of the other methods to say whether something suspends or, or not. And it, it's all known at compile time. There's two more types on the, on the stood side, which I'm not going to talk about so much. Um, not coroutine promise I'm not going to talk about at all. Stood coroutine traits, all I say is this is where you can customize how things get mapped and how other things actually work. Um, but we won't go into the details. What I do want to drill into a little bit more is each of the types that we need to provide. So let's have a look at those. In the task type, I say we define the promise type, but not an instance to it. We get the instance via the coroutine handle, which we do get given and can optionally hold on to. And it's also our responsibility to destroy. Now, when I say that the task has the promise type, nine times out of 10, you will actually de define it as an embedded struct within the task class. You don't have to. You can have a, a using declaration to uh, an external struct or class, or you can use those coroutine traits that I told you about to map them to something different. But one way or another, there's an association between the task type and the promise type. It has to be specified. Simplest way is just to embed it. And that's what we're going to do in our example. So let's have a look at the promise type. This is where you usually get overwhelmed. So again, I'll try to phase them in. You always need to provide these four methods. There's actually five. <laughs> return value and return void. It's one or the other. In fact, let, let's start there. This is what happens at the end of a coroutine. Either a return, a co-return, or drop running off the end. And the only difference is whether there's a value or not. So if, if the coroutine co-returns a value, it will call return value with that object. Otherwise, return void. Simple as that, really. Initial suspend and final suspend just say what happens at the start and the end of the coroutine. Should the coroutine start already suspended? or should it run until the first suspension point? Usually, well, most commonly I'd say um, it'll run until the first suspension point, but it's very often not. Again, you can use those um, suspend always, suspend never types. Final suspend, does the coroutine finish in the suspended state or uh, immediately terminate? Remember I said the coroutine can clean up itself. 99% of the time, it will be uh, suspend always, unless you know different. <laughs> Very tricky to reason about it otherwise. So really, it's only initial suspend you need to worry about most of the time. And then it should be obvious what you need to do. Get return object. It's not that tricky, but it's, it's more the, why do I need this? <laughs> this is the thing that actually gives you back the, um, the task type. So in the, the task owns the promise type, but the promise type has a method that returns the task type. And it gets a bit tricky with um, declaration orders sometimes. Uh, so you have a, so you are in the promise type. From the promise type, you can get a coroutine handle and you can pass that to your task type constructor and return it. You'll see that in action in a moment. Think of it as a task factory. Won't go too far wrong. There's a bit of space there. There's a couple more methods uh, that you may use. So if you have a co-yield in your co-routine, then whatever your value you pass to that gets passed to yield value. And unhandled exception, as you can probably imagine, if an exception is thrown from the co-routine or not handled within it, it gets passed to unhandled exception as an exception pointer. I think every example I've seen uh, just does cause to terminate. <laughs> we will continue that tradition. 
interesting thing about return value and yield value in particular, um, but all of these in general, actually, there's no uh, sort of strict uh, like virtual interface or anything like that. It's just all um, making a, a call. So you, you get to determine the value categories of the values. If you want to take it by const ref, by value, by R value reference, you get to decide that. So that's nice. And you can make it templated, of course. So there's quite a few methods there, but most of them do sort of make sense when you think about it. So let's have a look at the awaiter. Uh, there's three methods on the awaiter. Await ready, await suspend, and await consume. So if you remember, these methods will get called when you call co underscore await on something. Um, await ready is called first to decide whether you actually need to suspend or not. Because if it's ready, you don't need to suspend. So it's sort of the inverse to what you might think. Should suspend, but inverted. If it is suspended, then await suspend is called with the coroutine handle. So you get a chance to say what happens then, or just log or something like that. And similar, when return is called in the coroutine, then await resume is called. Sorry, when resume is called. We'll see all of these in action in a moment, but just to show you up front, this is all of the things that you need to write. So it looks like a lot, but that's what we have to do. So let's have a look. Over here. Now let's see our example using coroutines. Main is the same. We look in repo. That's the same. We look in load and build objects. This is almost exactly the same as before. There's one difference which I'll come back to later, which is basically this line. Uh, all of the resolve dependencies, require object, all the same. So there's no changes here. Now, if we look in the deserializers, um, I think this is very similar, not the same. We'll come back to that. But go to build object. And again, start with fitted bond discount curve. Returns a build task. It's the same, but then we do co-return object. So whereas before we were returning object, it was converted to a build task. Now we're actually calling co-return, which if you remember from the slide we just saw, that's going to call uh, return value on our promise type, which we'll look at in a moment. Slightly more complex example is fixed rate bond forward. This is drastically simpler than our previous batched lambda example. The dependencies, exactly the same in this design. But instead of that build task dot continue with dependencies and the big lambda, we just say co await dependencies, which we'll call our um, evoke our awaiter, call those methods, resume back up to the uh, yield back up to the, uh, the to the caller, and then later when you resume, it's going to resume here, and finally co-return object. I think you'll agree a lot cleaner, but there's another difference here that maybe is not so obvious, and that is that when you get down here and you're resuming, all of these values up here are still uh, in scope on the stack. Well, not on the stack, it's on the coroutine frame. Because all of these automatic storage variables are allocated in the coroutine frame, along with the promise type, which actually lets you do some interesting things. Like, if we look at our build for curve, remember we had to have that shared pointer to a shared pointer before? So we could pass it around. Well, now we can rely on this shared pointer still being around when we resume. So we haven't had to do anything, any extra work. This just looks like normal code except for these keywords. 
probably worth saying at this point, you've probably heard before, the only thing that makes these coroutines is the presence of these co-underscore keywords, co-await, co-return, or co-yield. We haven't looked at co-yield yet. Uh, in fact, before we do that, so we look at the build task. Remember our previous build task, our non-coroutine build task had that embedded data object. Well, basically the promise type is just doing that job. Look, we've got the ID, got the dependencies, got our object. We don't have that continuation. That's now managed by the coroutine machinery. So it's a bit simpler, but we have those methods. In fact, there's an extra one in there which I didn't mention. Co-return object. Remember I said that's the factory for the build task. It gets the coroutine handle from the promise, which is us. So most, most of the time you'll just copy and paste code like this. Initial suspend, suspend never in this case. Final suspend, suspend always. Always suspend always. Return value, we're taking by our value reference. So when you get to the co-return, we get our object. We can, we can forward, well, we can move it along. Unhandled exception, stood terminate, as promised. But we've got this await transform as well. Now you don't normally need this. But do you remember when I said that when you call co-await on something, the thing you co-await has that awaiter interface? That's not necessarily the thing you pass to co-await. Uh, if it is, your job's done. But if not, you can either provide a mapping using await transform. So here we're awaiting on these dependencies. We're saying when we get that, actually return a dependency awaiter. Or there's a couple of other ways we can do it as well. There's a co-await operator, for example. We don't need to get into all of those. We'll just briefly look at the dependency awaiter. It's very simple here. Await ready not should suspend. Await suspend and await resume here, they're just logging. You can do other things as well, but this is a simpler one. Um, and as you can see again, it's mostly just acting as an interface. There's a bit more to it. We've got to destroy the coroutine using handle.destroy. Um, make sure that we, because I'm using move semantics, that we actually move the handle. But, but there really, that's it. Oh, and resume. So our resume on our build task, we're forwarding on to coroutine handles resume, but we're just checking whether the coroutine is done. Because if it is, then we can return the object. And that is really all there is to it. Let's run that and you'll see that it crashes. This time it was deliberate. I'll show you why. <laughs> Let's um, have a look at... Uh, deserialize all. There we go. Because before we were returning a vector of build tasks, but now I've made this a coroutine as well, and it's returning a generator. I won't go into this in too much detail, but you can see down here, we've got that co-yield. So we did use a co-yield. There's no real advantage of doing it this way other than just to show you how it works. But so rather than returning the vector eagerly, we're just yielding each individual build task out. And that's why there was that small difference in the, the, the code that runs it. But why did it crash? Well, you can see up here, we've got a little highlight on these IDs. Um, I did say there'll be a brief appearance, appearance from Sonalint. It's telling us, I don't know if you can read that, it's a little bit small, but it says pass this parameter by value. It may be used after coroutine is suspended and may become dangling. And this is one of the, the biggest gotchas, I think, with, with coroutines, because it looks like, yeah, you should pass the, this vector in by const reference, as we would normally do. But if we do that, when we get down to this co-yield, it's actually fine up until that point. After that, it's going to go around again. But now we've, we've come out and gone back in again. That original vector is no longer there. It's dangling. So you can get dangling references on the way in as well as on the way out now. 
it's a big gotcha so it's great that's why i wanted to highlight that we do catch that which is quite nice but it even catches this so if i if i actually break after that co-yield that means that that vector is no longer used after the yield notice the highlight went away that's pretty nice but don't rely on that just always pass things in by by value let's uh get rid of that get rid of that and get rid of that try that again and that works and it runs in a similar time to before run it a few more times there we go 36 37 milliseconds so runtime's the same there's a little bit more in the build task a lot less in the deserializers i think you'll agree so i think coroutines has, has really helped here even though we don't quite have library support for the tasks yet which is one of the biggest weaknesses with the coroutines that we have so far what i didn't get a chance to do is show you i can very quickly run through yeah, i've got 10 minutes the um that generator I'll get rid of that now there we go so this generator it's another coroutine um wrapper so it's got a promise type it's got those methods it's got yield value this time and return void and holds an optional build task and then i have these methods has value current task and next so do we have another build task to yield because if we're finished then we won't have if we do what is it and then move to the next one i resume that's our interface which works it's fine but that meant that we had to slightly change our um, load and build objects we could add an iterator interface to this and make it more of a, a range based interface and in fact really there's nothing about this that is specific to our our problem except really the, the type here so that's fairly easy to generalize you can have a generalized generator template and that's exactly what std generator is which made it finally into c plus plus 20 23 i was going to say 26 there i'm thinking too far ahead c plus plus 23 has std generator 11th hour edition which means we'll be able to replace all of this code with just a std generator build task and in our load and build objects we'll just do a range-based for loop and it will work brilliant we're not quite there yet but it's coming later we may have helpers for the for async tasks as well i can get rid of a lot of the other boilerplate and at that point then i think we can finally say coroutines are in the language but hopefully i've shown you here that we can actually get quite a long way even today when you know how they work so i think with that i'm going to get back to my slides for the wrap up and questions uh, never remember that shortcut there we go oh no i'm too far okay i just wanted to get to here here we go uh oh Okay, it's normally got a URL there. I've missed it somewhere. Did I put it right at the end? Oh, lost it. Okay. Ask me for the URL <laughs> because I've got lots of references to other talks and articles and things. Um, but other than that, I think we've got a few minutes of questions. So, yeah. Oh, thank you. yeah and that's the other thing that was on that url <laughs> so actually if you go to maybe you can remember this level of indirection slash refs slash coroutines dot html if you can't remember level of indirection.com i've got extra level of indirection.com the redirects there so i should help you to remember it but ask me afterwards um if you if you don't remember that and that will have a link to the repo 
with all of this code. Um, I actually set up, because I did different versions of this talk, I've got one repo for the C++, no, the CPP con version, and another one for the meeting C++ version. This is mostly unchanged from the meeting C++ version, so I haven't made a new repo for it, so just look to that one. Any other questions? Yeah. I have a question. Oh, here we go. Thank you. Uh, I have a question a little bit in the spirit of the previous talk about uh, also efficiency. Um, you talked about these promise types and you said they are heap allocated. And I believe I read on CPP reference that um, the compiler can actually find out that if the called coroutine does not outlive the caller, then its promise type doesn't need to have to be um, heap allocated uh, and can be optimized. Can I actually check this? Can I enforce this? Or is this left up to the compiler implementer? So what you're talking about here is the so-called halo optimization, I think. Um, the idea is, yeah, if it can be proven by the compiler that the calling code outlives the coroutine itself, then it doesn't allocate the coroutine frame on the heap but on the stack. Um, I remember a proposal going through for something to be able to check it at compile time, but I don't remember the status of it. Did it? Do you remember? No. no. It's not. Didn't go. In, didn't get into twenty three at least. Um, there, there's there is discussion about it at least. I don't know whether it got derailed or not. I, lo I lost track of it, but it's definitely being discussed. That'll be really nice. Um, the other thing about the halo optimization is originally I think it was only Visual Studio Visual C plus plus that implemented it. Um, last I heard, uh, it wasn't working. <laughs> I don't know if it's deliberate or it just hasn't been maintained. Sounds like you might know a bit more, Daniel. Sorry? It's only in Clang. Only in Clang. Only in Clang now. Okay. Oh, well, it, it was in Visual <laughs> C++. It seems like it's moved <laughs> to Clang. <laughs> okay. Yeah, see, I'm a little bit behind on that one. Um, it's early days. Hopefully, eventually, that will come everywhere and um, become like the, you know, NRVO and be mandated most of the time. But we're just at the beginning of that, so don't rely on it. Okay, thank you. Um, that's only really an issue for you know, very tight loop coroutines on, on a real hot path. Most of the time, you actually get uh, a real benefit compared to doing things the other way. Like I showed you with how you things that you might have had to move around or allocate on the heap so you can move them around you can just stay in the co-routine frame. So most of the time, it's not an issue. Tima, uh, you got that? Yeah. yeah, can I make two comments on that? Yeah. One is, um, so yeah, you don't have this guarantee, right, that you don't have a heap allocation, but what you can do is you can create the co-routine immediately, suspend it, and then you can use it on the hot path from that point on. Just yeah, have to make so sure that the allocation is going to be on a different thread. You, you can tell Tima works in, in audio because <laughs> this is what you do a lot. You, you do all the stuff that is non-deterministic up front and then it's deterministic for the time that you need it on, on the whole pop path. So yeah, you can do that. Pay the cost when you, don't, when you can afford to pay it. Uh, I don't know whether that will always get you out of trouble, but good point. And, Thank you. Yep. And I have another quick comment. Um, there was actually a talk at CppCon 2021 by somebody called Eyal Zadaka. And the talk was called Using Coroutines to Implement C++ Exceptions for Freestanding Environments. It's like a whole hour talk about how far you get if you rely on this optimization. And um, there is another trick that I think he also mentions is you can, it's really ugly. So you can't supply your own allocator to a coroutine, but what you can do is you can overload, operate a new and delete. Mm -hmm. And through that, you can yeah. sort of hack your way through this in a way that you end up with a coroutine that doesn't allocate, but it's very ugly. Yeah. But you can do that today. Yep. Yeah, so all the usual, well, not all of the usual, you said, can't do allocators, but you can override, operate a new and delete to use some sort of pool or, or other. Uh, predefined block. So th there's ways around it even today. Thank you for that. Um, you mentioned there about using it uh, for exception handling, uh, which reminds me, not really to do with this talk, but you can abuse coroutines because they are sort of monadic. 
themselves. And you can use them to do other monadic things like error handling with optionals or stood expected. So you can you can create a coroutine not to do async stuff, but just to choose a different code path depending on whether something has a, a value or not. Uh, but that's beyond the scope of this talk, something to think about if you want to look into that yourself. Any other questions if we've got time? Um, you've already been, so... Ah, okay. Going here anyway. <laughs> um, uh, what does happen when you let the coroutine run off the end? You just said, like, it just always suspend, but when would I ever not do that? If I got the question right, you're asking what happens if you run off the end. Exactly. Uh, when I don't suspend in the final suspend. If you don't... Ah, oh, okay. So it's about the suspension point. Um, so if you if you do suspend never for the final suspend, you mean? Um, then I'm a little bit vague on this myself, but the coroutine itself um, or destroys itself. You don't get a chance to do anything at that point, uh, which means you may have things that you were relying on still being in the coroutine frame and they've been pulled from under your feet. So you have to be really careful about the lifetimes uh, because you may not know at what point that memory is going to go away. Uh, so if you really need to do it, then you have to be careful about it. But I, I wouldn't want to say I can tell you exactly what so, happens. So it doesn't leak, this. at least. Sorry? It doesn't leak. Like, like it, it doesn't leak. No, um, no. That's my understanding, anyway. Okay. Yep. All right. um, it's mostly useful if, you are, if you've got different coroutines running on different threads. So you don't want to have to write the extra cleanup code. They will just complete and, and you're done. But uh, I've not played with that yet. Uh, so yeah, just behind you. Thank you. You showed in your method that you used one co-yield and one co-return. Is it possible to use multiple co-yields? Oh, yes. And yeah. OK. And with uh, different absolutely. types, too? So in that example, um, too complicated to go back to it now, but you remember the co-yield was actually in a loop? So there were already multiple co-yields, mm -hmm. even if there's only one written. Yeah, every time co-yield is called, it will call yield value. And you get a ch it, it suspends and you get a chance outside to do something with that value and then resume, go back in, go to the next one. And they can, they can be just separately through the code. They can be in a loop. It's up to you. Okay, and if you I overload uh, yield value, I can even handle different yes. values in my... Uh, yes. Um, I haven't played with that enough to know what the limitations are, but I believe you, they can have different values. And so they can even be templates. Okay, thank you. Um, you can also have multiple co weights. Same principle. Okay, I think we still had a question over this side. Sorry, make you run. Yeah, it's more a, a follow-up from the previous one. Do you know why there's... Th because there's no option to provide the locators, right, to the coroutine? Do you know what's the reason for that? Uh, I don't know the reasoning behind it, whether that was a, the same okay. they didn't get to, or whether there's a technical reason that doesn't make sense. Okay. Um, I know the being able to optimize the allocation away was discussed at quite some length, so I imagine it was discussed and probably um, it's too difficult to do, or doesn't make sense. I don't know. <laughs> it's the short answer. Any more questions? In which case, I think we can resume the drinking. Thank you very much.